Okay, welcome back for part two of this evening's discussion on biodiversity. Pleased you've made the arduous journey from Studio One to Studio Two. And my thanks to Arla and Germinal for those videos. Now it's time for our second panel discussion of the evening. And I'm delighted to be joined by four more distinguished guests. With me now are John Deersley, who is head of natural capital at Savills. He's a particular focus on carbon net zero strategies and biodiversity net gain, as well as heading up the food and farming team in Sirencester. From Promar, we have Anna Clifford, an environmental consultant in their sustainability team. Since 2018, she's been working with farmers and water companies to deliver projects that improve water quality. We also have Stuart Pearson, who is a chartered forester and business development director at forestry firm Till Hill. And finally, fresh from the lambing shed, I understand, or possibly the lambing field, we're pleased to have Andrew Barber, an organic hill farmer from Pitlochry. And if I've uh, pronounced that wrong, my apologies, Andrew, you can pull me up on it later. I should say, before we get started, we're trying to get hold of those unanswered questions from session one and hopefully get to a few more of them. But keep them, keep them coming in. We look forward to having as many questions for our panel as possible. But Andrew, let me come to you straight away. Before we get stuck in, how's the lambing been going? We've had an ex probably the best lambing uh, that we've ever had, to be honest. Um, weather's been kind and... Yeah, uh, there's been remarkably few problems. So um, uh, until last night when we had to get some professional help in and, and landed up with a rare caesarean on a sheep, um, a very rare event for us. But otherwise, it's been incredibly good. Yeah, thanks. We're cool. making news already then. A happy farmer. Pleased to hear it. Now, uh, let's get into the serious stuff straight away then. We heard a lot about biodiversity policy in the first session, some quite, um, you know, a lot about the planning structure, but biodiversity in the broader sense as well. On your farm, how do you define biodiversity and what objectives are you working towards to improve it? I think you're on mute. There we go. Um, our objectives have uh, initially it started with uh, management of habitats because um, the grant system was pushing us that way and it was also in a kind of negative sense trying to avoid water pollution which was an issue here for us with phosphate enrichment of uh, a, a local loch um, and so um, you had that negative on the one hand and the positive of what was then the Pillar 2 funding, agri-environment funding, which was encouraging us to look after our semi-natural habitats. On this farm, they're all designated, so that made a huge difference to us. Um, it, got, it ticked all the boxes. And that's how we kind of started. There was an interest there on our part too, very much so. And uh, But you, that's talking 30 years ago now, it's an awful long, I can only just remember it. <laughs> and so are there government schemes you're a part of now, or is that kind of the wrong question actually? Is there a financial incentive really there for most farmers to do it off their own back, should we say? Um, firstly, there is a government scheme, but it's very much targeted still at uh, designated sites. Uh, how long that will go on for, I don't know. Um, but at the moment, we're in that, well, as this webinar talks about this transition, we don't know quite where we're going. Um, but if you look more broadly, there are undoubted financial benefits which come from thinking about biodiversity, but thinking more widely about how you manage the farm, which has biodiversity benefits. And by that, I'm meaning um, uh, making very clear, sure that your inputs are justified and both financially and environmentally, and that you concentrate on margin, not on yield. Margin is what really matters. Obviously, turnover is important, but margin is key. And it tends to be, and certainly in upland farms, a little less can mean a lot more. And we had seen what a lot more looks like. It wasn't a present pleasant place to be back in the early 90s. Mm. Tracing age payments, folks will remember that uh, kind of situation. 
Well, you touched on phosphate and, and fertilizer issues in general there. So let's come on to Anna. You know, uh, for, it's such a hot topic at the moment, uh, fertilizer use efficiency. Um, your specialist area is, 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 is water catchments. You must be kind of pleased then, right, that farmers are all trying to keep their fertilizer on their field at last. Is this, is this the boom times for you? Well, it, it's very much the most, you know, it's a sensible thing to do, isn't it? And um, I've been working with a water company in the south of England with the design and development of their fund. Um, and that fund is is offering financial incentives to do to do just that, really, is is to look at water quality benefits and to, to keep pesticides and, and fertilizers in the fields doing the job that it's supposed to do um, and keeping it out of water, uh, water courses and, and the underlying aquifers. So. Yeah, it's got to be a good thing. Okay. And what's your advice then to any farmer in or out of these schemes? They don't have to be in a scheme, of course, do they, to want to keep more of their fertiliser on the field? Is there any is there any top tips that you you keep in your back pocket? I think, as Andrew mentioned, actually, it's to look at your farming practices holistically and to see what changes you might be able to make, um, however small. Uh, to be continually reviewing your strategies, um, you know, considering whether or not fertilizers or pesticides are actually needed, um, and that comes back down to comes back to to viability, perhaps, uh, of of land. Um, so, you know, if you've got a boggy corner of the field, do we really need to be putting anything on it? Uh, so, yeah, and then you know, speaking to people, uh, there's a lot to be learned from from collaboration and and learning and sharing of ideas. And John, uh, these must be the sort of questions that farmers are coming to you, thinking about margin, thinking about nitrogen use efficiency, but biodiversity more general. I, I know you managed to hear a little bit of the, uh, the first session. Um, are you satisfied that you and your clients fully understand uh, this biodiversity net gain in the planning system? And, and the concept more generally, do, do you think farmers get it or is there still more more questions to be asked than answered? Um, I don't think anyone can sit here and definitively say they know all the answers. Um, only in 30 years time when we've been through this will we we'll really truly understand it. I think the bit that I'm looking at with clients and it linked into what Anna was saying then is that there is a long term policy direction here that's becoming very clear. And um, I think you've got to be careful about how you enter into specific schemes, particularly legal agreements and long term ones for that. But there's definitely a trend here, mainly about biodiversity, but also about carbon and water quality and a number of other things. That means that farmers have got to just start to think uh, more intrinsically about the environment and the effect of the environment in all of their farming practices. So, um, I mean, what, what I find, and it's no perfect graph, but, but effectively those businesses, you actively think about the environment in the same way they actively think about staffing or they actively think about, um, I don't know, crop rotations in more detail and things like that. They, those farmers are the ones who tend to have the highest profitability, tend to be the farms that are um, forward thinking and, and adopting methods that are ultimately driving their businesses. And I think it's it's accepting probably and relishing the fact that the environment and the, the farming effect on the environment is here to stay and building that into the core of the business rather than trying to push it to the outsides. And Stuart, then all these different objectives and tree planting is one of them. Really ambitious targets, whether you're in England, Scotland, Wales or wherever, we're not quite hitting them yet. And some folks say, you know, if we do, actually, that would be bad for biodiversity, not good. What would be your response to that? Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's a real challenge and you, you are correct. We're, we're nowhere near hitting the targets that the government has stated and there's a real scramble to, to sort of promote trees as the, uh, the great saviour uh, in, in many ways. Um, yeah, it, it is a challenge. Um, we don't want to repeat the mistakes of the past with, with trees uh, and it's very much the right tree in the right place. And one of the good things about trees, though, is uh, Anna touched on the boggy field corners and that sort of thing that are, are not suitable really for, for economic farming. And trees are very good at occupying that sort of ground. And a lot of farms have that ground that, that uh, people are starting to scratch their heads with and uh, can offer real alternative in, in that sort of land type. Um, you know, I wouldn't advocate 
you know, taking good land out to plant trees on, um, but they can form part of a wider biodiversity plan for a farm that, that, that encompasses all sorts of aspects. So it's about making the smartest use of every every hectare, I suppose, and that's the unifying link between all of us here this evening, whether it's food production, forestry, the land joining your waterways, it's fact finding finding that margin uh, in, in every part of your farm. But, you know, I think it'd be good to focus on some of the things carrying on from the discussion we've had earlier. Carrying, on, Let's focus on the things that are perhaps holding back farmers from achieving that. And um, uh, John, one of the things folks say is uh, the taxation implications for these long-term environmental delivery schemes. We, we, we touched on it in the first session, but you know, what are the questions that are left to answer there? Do we need to be going and beating a path to the Treasury to say, you know, there's something you need to tell us the answer to here before before farmers can, can jump into some of these things? Uh, yeah, so I think, first of all, farmers come in all different shapes and sizes. And um, so, you know, we've got institutional clients, for example, or charity clients who the tax angle is less of a, a driver. And they're probably the ones at the front of this um, in, in many situations. And um, for the private landowner, you know, benefiting from the various, um, particularly inheritance tax reliefs is absolutely key, as well as obviously is income tax on, a, on an annual basis. Um, and there isn't enough clarity at the moment exactly how these long term schemes will fit into that. Um, a lot of farmers try to, to utilise the benefits of agricultural property relief when passing assets from one generation to the next. And it's pretty unclear whether sort of what I would call the wider environmental schemes, biodiversity net gain being one of them, um, will, will qualify under the, or, uh, under the definition of agriculture. Um, for me personally, it would be a pretty massive policy own goal if DEFRA are pushing us in one direction, the Treasury are pushing us in another. So whether it's conservation property relief that comes around the corner or whether it's changing the definition of agriculture um, from, from where it has been, for me, that feels like a very natural step, but um, until it's confirmed, we will have to wait and see. Andrew, is the uh, tax tail wagging the management dog on your farm? No, not really. Yes, all these things that we've just heard about are very much I'm at that sort of succession planning stage for the next generation uh, coming on here. But it's not stopping us because... Um, uh, pretty much everything is covered by agricultural use. We're not talking about taking land out of agriculture. In fact, very much um, we see the role of certainly livestock in as a management tool in many of these habitats. So they still qualify as agricultural practice. Um, so we're not we're not stepping back from big areas of land or even little areas of land. You just adjust the management. Um, so it still qualifies as agriculture. Uh, the, you lose the property reliefs, um, that is, could be serious trouble for uh, all, all of us, really. But am I right in saying there's parts of Scotland in particular where, you know, wide scale forestry and destocking is taking place? So do you see that happening, continuing to happen? Do you think that or do you think that we'll have a bit of a reassessment before on there? Well, I think in Scotland, the reassessment is being pushed for very hard by farming interests now who are becoming increasingly alarmed at um, what the market is doing. And the market, uh, the timber market is, uh, the, the forestry market, investment market is targeting the sort of size of units that farms often present. And uh, that on the one hand, so that's hitting southern Scotland, central Scotland quite hard. And then in north of the Highland Folk Line, a different market, which is the carbon market, the um, greenwashing market, some people call it the green lairds, are targeting the bigger traditional voting estate. Hello. I'm just getting a little bit of static feedback there. I don't think it's any of our panellists. Our tech team will perhaps take a look at that. But um, Stuart, why don't you, you respond there? I guess the broader point is carbon versus biodiversity then. You did touch on it in your explanation before, but particularly in Scotland, you have to be honest, aren't the two, aren't the two uh, in competition with each other? Yeah, I mean, it, it is a hot market out there. And uh, Andrew touched on the, uh, you know, the large acquisitions that we've seen in the north of Scotland by uh, landscape scale acquisitions of, of large 
country estates for um, carbon and biodiversity net gain and and the likes. Um, and certainly, there is there is a pushback in southwest Scotland with afforestation um, taking taking ground. Um, the 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 appetite for uh, land that is com becoming available is 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 quite hot. Um, with uh, a number of investors looking at uh, at acquiring land, and, and we are very conscious of that as an industry that we don't want to be seen to be uh, just just you know because forestry is 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 hot a hot topic at the moment, and and the money is coming in that we're just taking up every piece of land. Um, it's it's a challenge. It is a challenge, and and you know where where the balance sits perhaps is 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 going to going to uh, become more apparent uh, as as the, the over the next two or three years i think and where does your work overlap with what anna's working on in terms of promoting cleaner waterways that's one thing where uh, forestry is helping deliver um a net good i know you've been working with united utilities is that correct Yes, yes. We've been working on some of their headwater um, um, work. They've been doing particularly in the north, the northwest, the uh, horsewater catchment area, um, using trees uh, on a landscape scale to um, improve water quality and biodiversity. Um, you know, they, you have the benefit with with these these sort of water companies to act on a landscape scale and and really create a, a change that that has a, a real meaningful impact um, in that sense. So um, yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's been interesting work, and it's using you know um, native native species. So they 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 act in sympathy with the the landscape and and you know, achieve what um, you know utilities want, but also uh, as a sideline, the, the the wider biodiversity benefits from it. Anna, um, any large scale tree planting happening around where you are? Then, or are you achieving it in different ways? No, um, as I say, I've been working in the south of England and um, there's there's very few large scale tree plantations, but there is there is greater uptake and interest. And as we were talking about earlier, it's looking for those smaller pockets, those smaller winds and, you know, maybe maybe encouraging farmers to, to try something new at, at that smaller scale before taking it, it wider. So. No, trees aren't aren't providing most of the biodiversity gain, but you know there's there there's certainly a place for them. But other other options such as you know uh, buffer strips or grass margins or infield strips, equally they're providing you know wildlife corridors and they're providing um, you know, species rich swards which have um, biodiversity gain. And you've been you're in the process of helping set up a fresh fund at the moment that will help farmers improve biodiversity. And those are sort of actions then that you anticipate them having to take. Yes. I mean, the fund that I've had the pleasure of, of being involved in is 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 very new. It's it's quite agile. It's uh, flexible. And um, and I think these are all things that are appreciated by farmers, as Andrew mentioned e earlier, you know, it's it's a bit of a, a rabbit warren, isn't it, to navigate your way through some of these scheme, schemes and funds and um, uh, payment systems. So developing something that is easily accessible was was one of the, you know, one of the important wins. Um, so, yes, that hopefully will will encourage uptake in the schemes. And, uh, and and again, is that on a local level, even though we know similar sort of things are happening across the UK? No, that it's very much a, a catchment level, um, but some of the catchments are, are enormous and, and various you know, water companies, utilities companies are developing their own schemes. So there's obviously a policy driven by government, but private and stakeholder groups are, are also making um, making quite significant changes and contributions. So is it fair to say then if you're in the catchment area really of any major waterway now that there will be a sort of local or regional scheme for you to take part in? Just thinking of those farmers who perhaps hadn't stopped to consider that yet. I know many are already doing it. Yeah, it, it's sometimes difficult to find out, um, but I would really encourage encourage you to, you know, speak to your countryside stewardship officer, speak to your neighbour, speak to, you know, a trusted advisor or an agronomist and um, do a bit of Google searching, but that there is there's often, you know, support, financial support out there and um, available pretty easily uh, with, you know, with via the application process. 
Okay. John, everyone's talking about food production at the moment, obviously with everything that's going on in, in the commodity markets. Farmers sitting down and assessing um, a catchment scheme might not be so worried, but if they're thinking about you know, a 30-year commitment to some of these biodiversity net gain um, agreements are, you know, we talked about it a bit in the first session, but I really feel like this must be a key concern for some folk. You know, they might be thinking in 10 years' time, we're going to be asked to plough from fence to fence again. Uh, what's your take on that? And I think the whole point about land use at the moment is, is absolutely key. And I mean, my career has not been decades and decades, but, you know, when I started, food was very much at the start of this. Um, energy and the rise of solar farms, particularly in southern England, um, has become another competing land use. And then these environmental schemes, whether it's mass tree planting or, or biodiversity schemes, for example, as other ones. So first of all, I think as a farmer, I think it's nice to be in demand. I think that's a good place to be. Um, what I do think, though, is it probably goes back to some really core understanding that certainly our, you know, our forefathers might have had in terms of saying, right, this is about the right land use in the right places. And, you know, Stuart talks about the, the right trees in the right places. You know, we all have bits of farm or bits of field that we know don't necessarily crop as well as others. Um, maybe those are the areas to focus uh, some of the biodiversity options on, for example. Um, equally, um, you know, there's some bits which you know, are best at producing food. And I don't think anyone here is, is debating whether food should be grown or not. I think that's still very much core to this. And you know, as, as we said before, with leaf, there's the opportunity to um, integrate the, uh, the biodiversity in with crop production. So it's not an either or. And um, I think the, the one bit that I, I would say is that some of these schemes, and they come in different shapes and sizes, I try and categorize them with clients in sort of two formats. One is about management changes. So things like grass margins that can go in, they could come out if they weren't effective or there's a better way. Other things are about land use change. And again, things like tree planting or some of the more permanent wetland options are very difficult, either from a legislative viewpoint or from a financial viewpoint to remove. So if you're opting into the, the permanent land use options, which can be the right choice in some situations, they're probably the ones that need really careful consideration. And it might be a risk perversely. If you do a really good job, you get slapped with an SSSI in a few years even. Yeah, I, I think technically you can't make triple SIs from man-made objects, but that's a technicality. You're absolutely right, though, that the sort of environmental impact assessment legislation definitely will catch people um, in terms of this, is if you do a good job and you make a nature reserve, yes, in 30 years' time, you're going to struggle to get out of it. Um, and, I mean, I personally see biodiversity net gain as a permanent land use change. Um, I think it is, you know, I don't know which way policy will be in 30 years time but my guess is that it's going to be very hard to put that back into traditional arable cropping let's say as we know it now anyway. So many of these schemes are different compared to you know government schemes in that the private sector are very much involved in administering this and, and even with biodiversity net gain actually you know they're the partner at the other end of the agreement it's just the government's created the market Am I right in saying, you know, farmers are really sceptical in often about things like elms, the, the government things, because they don't trust the RPA and his government agencies to, to deliver on time. Do you think, you know, the private sector inching into this is actually, you know, going to sort of transform that? Are we, are we going to, are we going to find, are we going to find dealing with other companies a bit more straightforward, or is it, or which way is it going to go? Um, I mean, my personal experience with, with DEFRA and RPA has always been mixed. Um, there's been good stories and there's been bad stories. And I think the same would apply with business. And um, I think just picking up something from the first session, which I think is a really big change here, is someone was talking about how they worked out the price for biodiversity net gain units. And they were talking about understanding all of the costs uh, associated with it in, over the 30 year period. I personally fundamentally disagree with that. This is not about income foregone calculations, as we might see under countryside stewardship, for example. This is about a thriving marketplace. So if you are enabling a multi-million pound housing development, I think it's right and fair that the farmer should take a slice of that, um, a fair slice of that. So um, I wouldn't try and use this as a sort of scheme that says, right, I'm going to use this as a way of you know, compensating for my lost wheat gross margin. No, this is about really, you know, 
changing the dynamics of farming businesses and the, and the revenue streams. And I think there's, you know, farmers need to understand the value they bring and we shouldn't sell ourselves short. Is this, you know, we're getting slightly off topic here, but I'm sure a lot of people will be thinking this. Is it going to be yet another break on development in general? You know, we, we, we're consistently building fewer houses than, than the government says we need. 216,000 last year versus a target of 300,000. This is just going to be one more hurdle on the road for a landowner who wants to sell development land or a farm worker who wants to buy a, a new house, isn't it? Yeah, I mean... Um... You know, we look at the potential income streams to farmers and that money has to come from somewhere and ultimately it comes out of either developers' pots or the land that they bought in the first place, probably more realistically. Um, so there's there's definitely a cost where there's an income. Um, I think though within the development industry, they have been very used to dealing with the intricacies of eco uh, ecology for a long time. You know, we've all talked about rehoming bats and moving newts and doing um, you know surveys on tree work, protected trees, for example, Example. So, yes, this is a different way and a, and a sort of building up approach, but I don't think it's complete revolution. So, um, I mean, there's there's always challenges on housing delivery. My personal view is actually if this marketplace functions properly, um, I think you'll have willing suppliers of biodiversity because the finances can be attractive for, for farmers and land managers and also actually a relatively straightforward way for developers discharging their um, biodiversity obligations. Okay. Let's go to a question from Tony Powell. Uh, he's a non-farmer, but he says he's interested in how much faith or emphasis uh, farmers put in long-term monitoring of the wildlife on farm. And uh, I think let's just frame that in terms of, you know, delivering for these different schemes. Uh, let's start with uh, you, Anna, then actually, once a farmer has signed up to one of these catchment schemes that commits to cleaner water or promoting biodiversity, how do you actually go about checking that they're uh, complying? Is it uh, legions of people with clipboards? <laughs> um, love a good clipboard. Uh, I think that the point I would first make is that um, a number of these schemes are tied to water companies' AMP cycles. So they are... are you know, a, a set duration of time. Um, and as as we touched on earlier, that there's short term gain and there's and there's longer term gain. And ultimately we would we don't want to be looking for environmental benefits long term. But commitment to these schemes is often much, much shorter. But in committing to these schemes, you will um, you know, the applicant is likely to be signing up to some kind of agreement, to some kind of contract to say, you know, I will do X and, and you will pay me Y. So there will be some monitoring, there will be some audit and inspection, depending on on the option that is selected. And that might mean someone, you know, carrying out surveys or uh, inspections of some kind. And Andrew, would there ever be a, a scheme that was sort of too prescriptive that would put you off? Uh... How, how, how many inspections do you get a year for this sort of thing? Well, we we have an extraordinarily light touch on, on the inspection side. In fact, ridiculously slow. I think you can make a criticism, I don't know about England, but certainly north of the border, that there's not enough feedback comes in. And that's been a feature of the sort of broader agri-environment schemes for 30 years. Um, so they tended to rely on people having to do things at certain dates so that makes it easy to monitor and that is prescriptive but we've had to accept that um just now nature scott english nature equivalent is working on what is really quite an interesting project which is farmer-led monitoring or farmer monitoring self-monitoring of how to assess what your animals are. it's aimed at grazing particularly, how you can assess the impact your animals are having on the different types of vegetation you have. And they've been um, road trialing this with really, as I understand it, quite considerable success getting buy-in from people who have before that thought it was too technical, too difficult, and, and therefore belonged to someone else. So th there are changes uh, about to happen, I think, and I welcome that. Um, but no, we, we get... Uh, probably once every 10, 15 years, someone from the government or nature organization takes a walk around. Otherwise, no interest from those kind of people. Lots of voluntary interest, 
a lot of people, you know, uh, botanists and whatnot who come on and enjoy the place, but that's different from monitoring. Mm. But a sort of a, a public good, I suppose, if people are there to in, enjoy your farm and the habitats you're creating, at least. Uh, Stuart, in the, in the forestry sector, um, if you commit to improve biodiversity there, how much how much monitoring is there if I, I, I plant a wood to check that I'm actually doing what I've signed up to? I think I would sort of echo Andrew's uh, statement. It, it is incredibly light touch. Um, certainly the departments that we uh, deal with are uh, uh, quite often under resourced and a lot of the uh, the monitoring is is very much left to our, our own um, our own requirements um, if you've specifically named a species um, that you are encouraging and seeing wanting to uh, see uh, uh, develop and flourish then um, you will be expected to provide returns but um, the audit external audits are are, are infrequent at best. And it, it must be such a balance, mustn't it, between obviously not being too onerous, but neither do landowners and farmers want to give the impression that they are greenwashing or, or, or taking the money and, and, and running. Are you satisfied that the right tree in the right place message is sort of filtering through on the ground and, and, and the new woodland being established now is going to improve biodiversity? Yeah, I mean, you know, the modern woodlands are, are the actual um, process of establishing a woodland um, is governed under the UK forestry standard. Um, it has uh, guidelines that uh, create a minimum uh, acceptable standard. Um, the process, if you go through um, a, a grant, um, in England um, is um, monitored and developed in conjunction with the woodland officers. So the actual establishment phase and the the, the um, creation of the woodland is is monitored and payments are made upon satisfactory production of what uh, what you stated you were going to uh, um, create. Beyond that, um, it is it becomes uh, you know less uh, certain that it will be inspected um, as it as it develops. There are maintenance payments. And one would assume at some point that you are going to get an inspection, but it, it is not um, a, a given. John, um, Helen Beer has made an observation. She's saying her uh, catchment sensitive farming uh, officer is uh, has you know is covering too big an area to to be able to help farmers in the way that they need. They're covering uh, all of North Devon. Where would you say if if um, that person is not available? What are the other sources of of information uh, are out there for people looking to sort of start you know cut through cut through all the jargon and the, and the difficulties? I, I, and, I, and this is not an, I'm simply an advert for your own services. I should add, but what what other help is out there? Um, well, I think they should start off by reading Farmers Weekly because I'm sure there'll be plenty of good stuff in there. Um, failing that, there are some land management firms around who would happily help. But um, it, I think Anna's absolutely right in before is that this is something that people need to be a little bit um, uh, go out and understand and do some research on, you know, whether that's internet research, whether it's talking to the agronomists, whether it's talking to your neighbours, all those sorts of things. There's no sort of one directory to go and look at these type of, of schemes. And I think they're probably linking it back, though, into the, the inspection point as well. This isn't something that should be sort of pushed over into the corner. I, I see this as a crop in the rotation. You know, it is an absolute key part. But if, if it's a product that's being produced, it needs to be a valuable product that farmers are proud of. So, A, I think, you know, invest proper time in it to make sure it's right for your business rather than something you feel you should do. So invest the time and whether that's with outside help or not. Um, e equally, um, when it comes to the inspection piece, be proud of what you've delivered. Um, you know, you've created something, there's a reason you've done it, and you don't necessarily need to go and shout it from the rooftops. But if the inspector comes round, I don't think we should be afraid of that as long as, as an industry, we're actually delivering on what we say we're doing. And, you know, the, the broader question, I suppose, in, in terms of advice is, uh, are firms like Savills and, and, and not Savills in particular, but the whole advice sector, you, you know, when you think about um, elms, biodiversity net gain, localised schemes, carbon markets, the whole shebang, 
isn't government creating something a bewildering complexity here that it won't be possible for a farmer to deal with on themselves they're effectively creating a, a market for the advice sector as much as for farmers aren't they i think you know, we are in a massive position of change um, and whenever there's change there's always the fear that some will get caught in the headlights and not know which way to turn um, I think the, the trick to this, most farmers have both financial and non-financial objectives that they want from their, their businesses. And biodiversity and the wider environmental piece with the new markets that we're seeing, whether they're from a public source or a private source, has the ability to tick both of those. You know, they can definitely be profitable and they can also help people enjoy the, the homes that they often live on and, and work on. So um, I personally think if, if you can step back and actually absorb this, this is it's certainly designed to help farming businesses. Um, and I think the general policy here, actually, I think a lot of farmers, if they embrace, will, will enjoy it. Certainly the clients I've worked with, they've always gone back and said, yes, we are very happy with the sort of habitat we've created rather than, oh, I really wish I'd stayed in a you know, wheat, barley and rape rotation. Uh, and I should say, Helen's just followed up. Uh, uh, forgive me for not realising this, Helen. She's saying, actually, some of the schemes aren't accessible uh, full stop, even if you get your advice from elsewhere, because you need that support from the uh, catchment sensitive farming officers to sign these things off. And there's a, there's a broader question here for, for everyone, I guess. We've touched on all sorts of things that, that, that might be barriers to farmers intervening uh, and one of them then is 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 resource and uh, what what are the others are farmers is it so complex that farmers are going to turn their back and and what's our advice to government i suppose they want to hit these uh, environmental uh, targets these ambitious environmental targets what do they need to do that they're they're not doing now Let's come come back to you first on that john um, i think i think clarity is the thing that most people want on on this is um, you know extras help from the CFOs, for example, is, is fantastic. And I know Helen's point, there are some things that require their actual signature. But I think most of the barriers I see are people saying, you know, either fear of, of what's there because it's not particularly clear. And we talked about taxation um, as being one of the great examples of that. The other one is the sort of fear of something better coming along um, or, or, you know, or I'm not going to do this today because something else is coming down the road, which might be better or different or whatever else. So I think some really clear statements of this is exactly how the tax treatment is going to be. This is exactly our 10 year plan for the schemes coming down the line or the grants that are becoming available. And I think that will help people plan. Um, I mean, the other one, which is a big topic we might talk about later on, is, is the relationship between landlord and tenant and how um, you know, the, the government may need to look at, at trig reform, you know, tenancy legislation as well to help enable some of these schemes because they, they don't often fit well within the existing landlord-tenant relationships. We will hopefully come back to that, but, but first of all then, uh, Anna, any other barriers that you've identified when you're speaking to farmers that perhaps are easy fixes? Yeah, I would echo uh, John's comment there. I think transparency is is really important, um, and and again, trying to reduce that that fear, reduce that that um, perception of risk, and and I think, in my experience, the way around that is just to be having upfront and honest conversations and to take the time to get to know those individuals because a lot of this comes down to you know what's going on on a particular farm you know how is that farm functioning what's their management style and how can we bring you know social sustainable and environmental benefits so I think it's important to whilst we need to look at um, you know, their overall strategy and at a very bro broad level, we also need to get down to quite a granular level uh, at farm level too. Andrew, if not you, then the farmers around you, what's what's holding them back and what would make them uh, jump into some of these schemes if, they, if they're not already? Is, is, it, is it fundamentally, do we need more money for some of these actions? Well, at the moment, um, there isn't the option in Scotland for many farmers. It's almost impossible to get into um, the uh, what is the shadow leftover of the old Pillar 2 funding, the EECS uh, funding. Um, but if you go back 20, 30 years ago, when the first agri-environment scheme was proposed, and they were just proposed in certain parts of Scotland, they had very high uptake, over 90%, which is extraordinarily good. 
And that was because it was seen as extra money. And it was doing something, people were insecure at that time. This seemed to be a way forward. Um, and so I suspect that we're again going to be in that same place as we were 30 years ago. Um, and there, I think, lack of, uh, there is here, just as in England, a lack of clarity. And that makes it very difficult to plan. Um, but also when people look ahead, I think, you know, the traditional five-year scheme, which has been the traditional government one, I think, certainly in Scotland, I don't know, England or Wales or Northern Ireland, but five years is two, is a very short time in the farming planning cycle, if you like. Mm. So I think there are real issues uh, uh, there about the length and timing and of these kind of support schemes. Um, uh, but at present, as we stand, as I reiterate, if you, um, our neighbours can't get into schemes uh, because they either they're not on a designated site or they don't. It, so that everyone's living on the old pillar one, the basic payment kind of thing and waiting to see where it goes. Well, there will be a basic payment there for a bit longer than, than here in England, uh, which will be, we're all watching with interest, both parties watching each other, I guess, to see yes. who, who gets on better in the long term. <laughs> so, yeah, there's quite a bit of that. There's quite a bit of that. <laughs> Stuart, we touched on those tree planting targets before. Uh, what, what's holding people back? And, and, and big, big capital costs initially, and of course, you, inflation affecting everything at the moment are there, is the grants are not going up in line with inflation is that going to become more of an issue for you or have i got that wrong yeah that it is a, an issue um the uh, grants are paid on standardized costs uh, based on standardized costs up to a cap um it isn't sufficient um and it is a, it's a real challenge um i think what's holding tree planting back is it's a it's a permanent land use change once you've once you've planted a woodland it you know by all intents and purposes it is permanent so you've got to make the right decision um it's there is uh, elms coming down the line there's a lot of uncertainty as where that's going to sit um and people are um i think um other people have touched on it you know hesitant um you know there's there's a lot of confusion as to you know what to do for the you know, to, to, for the right thing um there's there's so many option options there's you know trees compete with the same ground that can be used for other um options uh, that, uh, uh, that may not offer may not um be a permanent uh, chain land use change that you could have other options in the future um i'm so i'm not selling trees very well in that in that respect but it, it is a challenge um you know the government are standing uh standing uh tall and saying trees are we need more trees but it's not coming down to the you know, down onto the grassroots um as of yet um they do need to review the incentives if if they are going to start achieving those targets and but be very careful that it doesn't displace other options as well um we do we do not want and i said we don't want the the, the, the trees appearing in the, the wrong place yes and, and farming unions uh really campaigning to to sort of uh enshrine food production alongside all of these these other objectives in law where, wherever you are in the uk that's a real aspiration for them look we've, we've only got a few minutes left and john i do want to come back to you then on this landlord tenant issue We've, we've talked so much about the opportunities as well as the concerns of landowners, but for tenants, there's just that whole extra layer of, of uh, complexity. I mean, first of all, I keep hearing that, you know, land has been taken back in hand. Are we going to see a, a shrinkage of the tenancy sector, would you say, um, if, uh, if, if some of these options are perhaps too attractive, shall we say? Um, I, mean, I think it, it's definitely um, a, a consideration in how land is is occupied within the UK. You know, a, a strong and thriving tenant sector has been the backbone of a lot of agriculture for a number of years, and farmers, uh, you know, farmers, both landowners and um, tenant farmers, um, have, have done a lot to shape the landscape. Um, I think one thing that's becoming clearer is that certainly as a lot of these long term agreements are coming through, they they do two things. A, they affect the capital value of land, and that tends to be the landlord's uh, sort of asset to, to look at. Um, and then the, the other bit that they um, do is they provide 
comparatively low risk income streams. And what I mean by that is that if you sign up to a 30 year agreement and you get paid on year one, yes, there's some risks about tax and about long term management, but actually the cash is received. So two of the reasons why landlords um, would, would typically go to a farming business is they don't want that day to day management control and that day to day trading risk of the volatility of agriculture. So those things have been removed, which will encourage landowners to say, yes, we'll enter into these schemes directly. And um, that said, I think some of the uh, the the day to day land management and Andrew referred to it uh, earlier on in terms of this still looks and feels a lot like agriculture. You know, livestock is still going to be out there in the fields, you know, in, in maybe in a slightly different format, but they'll still be there equally, you know, whether it's um, forestry management or, or looking after um, uh, buffer strips or anything else like that, that sort of operation still needs to happen. Now, my personal view is that we will move away from a landlord tenant split of the cake into a landowner and contractor type split of the cake. So both parties can still play to their strengths, still demonstrate the skills that they've got, but actually the uh, the way that those businesses are structured will be, will be different. Um, and that's probably the way I see um, a number of landowning clients starting to think is saying that we don't want to be directly involved in in driving tractors or, or grazing sheep, for example, but we do want to have access to the income streams the environment can bring and some of the non-financial benefits that being involved in the environment can, can have. Now, if the TFA was that here, would they not say that sounds like, um, from the tenant's perspective, um, uh, even less long-term certainty than they have now. That sort of contractor role is, is very transactional and very short-term, isn't it? Um, it? It can be. Um, I mean, equally, it can be very long-term. So, I mean, if you look at the O&M sector of solar parks, for example, many people are signing up to 30, 40-year you know, operating maintenance contracts on those solar parks. So I don't think it has to be short-term. Um, I mean, again, I don't want to give them a ding dong with the, the TFA, but there can sometimes be benefits to both parties in having short term agreements and long term agreements. And, you know, uh, wearing my, my hat as a, a land agent for Savills, you know, we, we put out a number of co um, uh, um, tenant operate, uh, sorry, uh, land out for, for tenancies. And, you know, there's often times when, when um, tenants come forward very keen to have regular rent review. Uh, provisions or regular um, break clauses within within agreements, because actually their farming businesses are changing as well. So I personally would like to steer away from a very heavy legislative framework that says it has to be done like this. And this is the only way into probably more that we see in terms of the sort of general legal provisions of saying that this is the broad structure, but it's down to the two commercial parties to build the terms of that. And ultimately, that's going to deliver a, a sort of fairest, most level playing field over the long term. If it's stacked in one person's favour or the other, it will only ever, someone will always feel grumpy. And if that happens, you know, nobody wins. We, a quick question on, on solar panels, which I, I jumped over earlier, but now you've touched on them, I will ask, is there any biodiversity net gain that would fit in with a solar farm development? There's two income streams in one field, is there not? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, is the short answer. Um, if you've got land that's gone from, say, arable production into solar, you've probably got some species rich grassland being established underneath the solar panels or certainly could do. And you're likely to be committing land over a 30, 40 year time period for the solar panels anyway. So there's a very natural benefit there. Um, equally, and we haven't strayed into the world of sort of stacking and bundling, but there's probably a carbon benefit and there's probably a nutrient benefit and there's probably a water benefit as well. So I think when people are looking at the agreements they're putting in place for solar or any other long term, just be very clear about what benefits you're handing over to the other party and which ones you're retaining back um, uh, for the for the landowner. OK, we're nearly out of time. Uh Final question, a bit of fun. I would just thought I would rattle through. George Easter said, here, here is uh, the policy outcomes he wants. Halt the species decline, uh, halt the decline in species abundance by 2030, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, plant 10,000 hectares of trees per year. That's in England. I know there's a second one in Scotland. Improve water quality and have a vibrant food, and profitable food and farming industry and not engineer 
um, over-engineer or complicate schemes? Uh, uh, a yes or no answer from all the panellists. Do you think they're going to be able to uh, achieve any or all of that, Andrew? No. <laughs> Anna? Some. Some. Stuart? Some, <laughs> yes. And John? Yeah, some. Uh, I, they won't achieve all of it, but there's definitely some ability to do most of it, I think. Well, there we are then. Look, um, that's about time we all we all have. Dear me, that's about all we have time for. My first stumble of the evening. That's not too bad, is it? But a little bit of optimism there from our panelists at the end, and certainly a lot in our first panel. I feel uh, those uh, representatives from the civil service really feel like I think they're setting up a big scheme for the future, an ambitious scheme, that one that will uh, deliver uh, an enormous amount. But of course, it's all to play for at the moment. Uh, there's still some key decisions to be made, certainly with biodiversity net gain in the planning sense before the transition period ends. And so much of this is in the nascent stage. Uh, so please do keep reading your files weekly, week in, week out, and we will keep you up to date with everything, hopefully, as it happens. But thank you to Anna, Andrew, Stuart and John for their time and expertise there. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have and that you now have a little bit of a greater understanding of this complex area and some food for thought, perhaps some key questions to go out and, uh, and get some help with answering that are specific to your farm business. So in a minute, we're going to end with the final video of the evening, which will be from Frontier Agriculture, but just a couple of points of housekeeping first. If you know someone that wasn't able to join us this evening that would find this interesting, then please do remind them it will all be available to watch on demand. Just go to fwy.co.uk or check our YouTube channel in the days ahead. It might not be on there straight away. And please also take a moment to answer the poll that should be appearing on your screen shortly to leave us some feedback and help us make improvements in the future. As I said at the start, this is the final transition webinar for this series, but we will be returning in the near future in print, online, podcast and by webinar as we help you grapple with all of these changes taking place. And you can find out more information on the whole project at fwi.co.uk forward slash transition. Big thank you to our technical team, which helped everything run smoothly this evening. And of course, to all of our transition partners for making this series possible. On behalf of the panelists and myself, a huge thank you to you two for joining us this evening. And we will leave you now, as I say, with the final video from Frontier. Thank you and good night.